Hello and welcome. My name is Art Jones. I am the founder of the Otter Standing Out, where we use brand storytelling to help you market better and sell more. And today I am pleased and excited to be presenting to you um, how to monetize your voice during a pandemic and after as we go into the next normal that's before us. So speaking online with confidence, technique, and style is something I hope I impart to you today. Um, in order to do that, we're going to take a dive into what Plato called 2,500 years ago from the steppes in Greece. He said, those who tell the stories rule society. So if he knew that then, that's pretty powerful. Science was emerging at the time. But fast forward 2,500 years to where we are today, where we can put somebody in an MRI, tell them a story, and watch the different parts of their brain light up as if they were actually in the story. We can put people in the room, draw blood from them, tell them a compelling story, draw blood after they've heard the story, and we could tell that during the time they were listening to the story, that certain hormones were elicited into their bloodstream. Um, there's a story that brings you sadness or empathy. Oxytocin might begin flowing in your bloodstream. A story that makes you feel anxious and afraid. A horror story might make cortisol, the hormone, flow in your bloodstream. Those two hormones and the stories that elicit them are effectively changing the biology in we as humans. So if Plato knew it 2,500 years ago and science tells us today that those who tell the stories rule the world, why aren't you yet using story and helping your business grow? Well, that's what we're here to do today to help you maybe better appreciate the power of story to help you and your personal and professional brand and the business that you support reach more customers and grow. But this is a sales conversation. This is a conversation about selling in general and story in particular. So let's do a quick survey. I want to do a little quiz. So get your little pens or pads or iPad or mobile device out or just that really powerful memory you have. I'm gonna give you, I will give you five different types of salesperson. And I want you to think of your style or think of the style of someone you admire that sells, that you know is very successful and match up with one of these five. And then we'll give you the answer that the data says who is the most successful. So here we go. The first example is the relationship builder. This is somebody that builds a strong customer relationship generous in giving time to help others, and gets along with everyone, relationship builder. The next type is a problem solver, reliably responds to internal and external stakeholders, ensures that all problems are solved in a timely way, very detail-oriented, problem solver. This is number three, the hard worker, always willing to go the extra mile, does give up, doesn't give up easily does not give up easily, self-motivated, interested in feedback and development, the hard worker. So far we have the relationship builder, the problem solver, the hard worker, and now we go to number four, the lone wolf. Follows own instincts, self-assured, and difficult for a sales executive or sales manager to control. That's the lone wolf. And then lastly is the challenger. The challenger always has a different view of the world, understands the customer's business, loves to debate, and pushes the customer. So there we have it. We have the five, the challenger, the lone wolf, the hard worker, the problem solver, the relationship builder. Now take a minute, reflect on those five. Think which one reflects your style or think of which one reflects the style of somebody you admire that isn't successful um, growing their business through sales. 
and uh, let's take a second and we'll be right back after you've given some thought to what the answer to your question is and time's up so how many people are relationship builders that's always a highly sought after uh, type because relationship builders build their strength on the old the old saying in sales you have to be known liked and trusted who's more known liked and trusted than the relationship builder so what i'm going to give you is a percentage of high performers that fall into each of these five categories so relationship builder represents seven percent of the high performers surveyed and there were 683 people surveyed um, the survey was conducted by the sales executive council of uh, skills and diagnostics seven percent of the high performers were relationship builders that's surprising right what about next how many problem solvers in the room problem solvers represent 12 percent of high performers then following that, 17% of the high performers are hard workers. So if you take those in total, um, we're really looking at maybe 36%, a third of the population of salespeople surveyed are at the bottom of the tier, the relationship builder, the problem solver, the hard worker. Where's that leave us? The people that drive most success through the sales effort, the lone wolf, the person that follows their own instinct, the person that's self-assured and difficult to control. Is that somebody you want on your team? Well, they represent 25% of all high performers that are doing an excellent job. Full one quarter of the population of successful salespeople are the lone wolf. But lastly, representing 39%, almost 39%, what can I say? That's the challenger. And they're always they always have a different view of the world. They understand the customer's business. They love to debate and they push the customer. The challenger, and this is a survey that was conducted and embraced by a book that was authored maybe 12 years ago, maybe 15 now. It's called The Challenger Sale. And The Challenger Sale effectively is saying that if you do the work to understand your customer's business and you have the confidence that you know that customer's business so well in the technology that you offer and the problems you solve, that you effectively go into the customer's office and say, I know you're trying to solve the problem by doing this, this, and that, but have you considered doing X, Y, and Z? That's what I believe, and that's what's worked for me and the customers that I serve. That's the challenger. Now, this is really a great exercise, a great survey, and hopefully it was kind of fun for you to see where you fit in that hierarchy of five, challenger, lone wolf, hard worker, relationship builder, and problem solver. I believe that there's a sixth person. And you're probably thinking because Art is the storyteller, that he's gonna say storyteller. And not exactly. I think it's the person that does all five of these things well. And that person is simply a, a committed leader. Someone who's committed to representing the products or company that they have built or the company they work for and they do the work. They do the work to have skills that serve the great leaders throughout history and, and the great leaders in business and enterprise today. The first and most important thing that I believe leaders have is integrity. Integrity, that's character. Where's integrity come from? Whose shoulders do you stand on to get here today? Was it your college roommates, your grandparents, your mom, your dad, your brother? your sister, um, your Girl Scout leader, 
who imparted wisdom to you that you carry today that forms the lane that you stay in. So when we see you, you don't waver. That's what integrity is. That we have confidence that you're always going to present in the same way. That you're going to never do those things, but always do these things. That's what leaders have is integrity. And I think if you're the challenger, sometimes the lone wolf occasionally, the hard worker always, the relationship builder, because you do believe in being known, liked, and trusted, and a problem solver. And you incorporate all of these elements into the brand called you. And when we see you walking into our office, we think of that is what makes you who you are. And we label that as the brand called you and we give you all the integrity that comes with that. That's not enough though. Just having integrity is not enough. That's who you are and why you do what you do. Emotional intelligence is next. And emotional intelligence means that you're self-aware and you know where your integrity comes from. But emotional intelligence is an outward exercise as well and it's empathy for all intents and purposes. And it's when you look at the audience of the people in the businesses that you serve. When you commit to doing the work to know them almost as well as they know themselves, to know their narrative, to know what they celebrate, to know what keeps them awake at two o'clock in the morning, then you are using your emotional intelligence, your highly tuned, well-nurtured sense of emotional intelligence and you're connecting with the people that you're serving. You're understanding what they, what pains them, what keeps them awake at two o'clock in the morning, where their gains are, when they pop the champagne and throw a party to celebrate. In order to do that, you have to define them first so you know where to find them so you could essentially have a conversation with them and say, you know, I think I want to sell product to you and here's what I bring to you that adds value. What do you think? And I built this product because I understand from my research and conversations that at 2 a.m. occasionally you'll wake up kind of pulling your hair out saying, how do I fix this problem? Because all of my ideal customers and the businesses that I serve have the same problem. Is that right? So you're not just in your bubble thinking of what the implication is about the people that you serve. You want to know explicitly what challenges them. And the only, only way to find out what explicitly challenges them is to go talk to them. And this is a bit of what I like to call design thinking or human-centered design thinking, or you can call it just simply being customer-centric. In other words, you don't do anything in your business without really engaging the people you're doing it for, your customers, to validate that this product that I've designed, it's orange and it does these things. And they say, well, great, that thing that it does is amazing, but orange, I hate orange. And when you survey all of your customers, none of them like orange. Well, you're back to the drawing board. Maybe it's purple. That the color is that they want. And as a business owner, you do what your customers want. So let's take this next step is where we go from having integrity, nurturing our sense of emotional intelligence. The next thing a great leaders have is being a strong communicator. And this is where we go back to what Plato said. Those who tell the stories rule society. And, and here's what I believe. Story selling is not simply storytelling. Because if, if it was that, I mean, humans are wired for story. This is what we do. We think, we dream, we process problems and solve problems by putting them in story equations. We talk to our friend and say, let me tell you a true story. This happened and I've got to figure out what I've got to do. Let me tell you the story. And then you and your friend problem solve around the story that you've articulated. Great leaders are strong communicators. They believe what Plato believed, but they also believe that their sense of emotional intelligence 
gives them the patience to do the work to understand the people in the audience that they're trying to reach, whether it's a leader that has employees or a general that has troops or a coach that has a team. When she as a coach has a team, if she has the patience to get to know everyone on her team and to really understand where each of them is on their own emotional intelligence equation, then she can always match them where they are. She can always communicate with them on the channel that they wanna be communicated on. They can, she can communicate using the words that she knows will resonate with them. But most importantly, she, the coach, is prepared to listen more than she speaks. And really what that means is that she's made a commitment to doing the work, to genuinely understand what is going on with the people that I'm in service to. Because a coach is in service to the team. And in order to get the team to accomplish more, the coach must know them well, to push the buttons that need to be pushed to get them to jump higher, run faster, do whatever the team mission is. Integrity. A highly tuned and nurtured emotional intelligence enables you to be a strong communicator because when you've done the work to know who you serve, when you've done the work to know their narrative almost as well as you know your own, when you've done the work to know what keeps them awake at two o'clock in the morning, then you know what's in their business that you need to solve. And when you know those things, when you communicate to them your product story, you're communicating a story that is like music to their ears because finally, finally, someone knows where my pain is. Someone's speaking to me as if they know exactly what I'm struggling with. I'm gonna go celebrate. <laughs> Here's a story that happened to me once upon a time. Um, I've worked for years in large enterprise technology sales. And when I was somewhere mid-career, I'd gone from selling $5,000 things where I sold feature function benefit and I knew how to objection handle. And it was rewarding work. I had learned some skills. I'd learned the first skill um, was effective listening. And in my early career, I thought effective listening was simply leaning in and paying attention to what the person was saying. But as I moved from $5,000 purchase price for a product to a $500,000 piece of software that required $500,000 worth of professional services to install and make work over the course of 18 months, I was selling something the customer really couldn't see. It was intangible. I was selling an idea. I mean, you don't back a truck up to a loading dock to deliver software. You build it and it lives inside of a computer. So you really never see it. It just does what you say it's going to do. When I got to that level, I realized that effective listening was really knowing what questions to ask. Let me say that again. When I got to the point where I was selling the intangible thing, the way a coach sells the idea that I can help you resolve your problems. It's intangible. In order to convey that, you have to know what questions to ask and let the person solve their own problem. And that's what I had begun doing. And there was a, a healthcare company in Las Vegas. I was uh, working with a company in San Diego and I had a lot of fun traveling from California to, to Vegas to, to, to work with this client who doesn't like going to Vegas. And um, I think over the course of six visits, um, which is a fairly short sales cycle, um, a lot of interesting things happened. I, selling technology, I always traveled with a systems engineer, um, the person that would twiddle the bits and make them all work and, and was there to keep me honest <laughs> for all intents and purposes. But here's how the story goes. We fly into Vegas and uh, get to McLaren and we go to the account and um, we're greeted by a team 
led by the executive who's the decision maker, economic buyer. And he shepherds us into a conference room and um, we sit and we, we talk. And um, I asked if I could use the whiteboard that's on the walls of this conference room, walls everywhere, conference room covered in whiteboard. So I, this is my perfect uh, scenario because I'm a visual learner and I like to teach with visuals. So because it's software and it's technology that's going to solve a problem they're having with their big, huge infrastructure of technology and tools that they use to serve their insured community of customers. So I begin asking questions and I, I know healthcare inside and out. So I'm prepared. So I ask some really thought provoking questions of them and they tell me some things about what they're trying to do and where the challenges are and what technology they have. And I'm drawing all of this stuff on the whiteboard as we go. And after about 90 minutes, um, they've got a hard stop and I say, okay, thanks for inviting us in. Um, would love to come back and continue the conversation because I think we've got a better sense of what you're doing and where the challenges are and, and, and maybe where the opportunities are to, to accomplish more in the future. And they say, sure, why don't we make a, arrangements to meet again in about two weeks. We come back two weeks later and they take us to exactly the same conference room and to our surprise, the whiteboard I had drawn on was not touched, it was still there. And I felt like, you know, the kid coming home from first grade that had a picture that he drew in class and the teacher had put it up, the teacher had given it to me and my mom put it up on the refrigerator, it was still there. So I'm kind of excited and kind of flattered that they kept this visual um, of their infrastructure that I had drawn. And then that meeting, another 90 minutes, we extended that story more visually, extending the infrastructure, extending some of the challenge that, challenges that we saw happening within the infrastructure and um, some of the opportunities where we saw maybe we could process and prove some things. This went on for three more months and we parachuted in and every time they took us into the same room, the same whiteboards are covered with our artwork. And after, I can't remember now whether it was the fifth or sixth meeting, we walk in and we know we're getting close to either winning the business or not. And I think mid session, we're not quite near the end and we're well beyond the beginning. And the decision maker stops us and says, hey, all right, stop. Um, you know, we only have another 45 minutes, but this has been amazing. Over the course of these weeks, we, we clearly understand that you know our infrastructure very well. You understand what we're trying to accomplish. You understand the challenges that we have, and you've articulated some opportunities that we have for process improvement by using something, but you haven't yet told us what we are buying. And I didn't fall dead off my chair or anything, but certainly I was delighted to hear those words. You haven't yet told us what we're buying. But this is the story of what happens when you commit to doing the work, to know your customer so well that you know their narrative. Story listening. So when you go into a session where you're drawing on a napkin or you're drawing on a room full of whiteboard and you're using visual storytelling to let them know that you are confident in knowing what you know about them, about their infrastructure, and about their pathways to finding solutions. That's where a leader is better than the challenger, the lone wolf, the hard worker, the relationship builder, and the problem solver, because you're all of those things packed into one. But your the ideas are what you're leading with. You are just as smart as the people that are sitting around the table inside the company that you're visiting. And when you have that kind of clout and you've done the work to establish that clout, that's the story listening part. Story listening you can do in your home office all by yourself before you meet the person that you have an opportunity to do business with. Then when you meet them, the stories that you do tell resonate with them because you know what stories to tell. 
you know what's important to them. You can take all the data on the kitchen table that you stared at preparing for this call, and you can take that data instead of calling the ones and twos and zeros and commas and dollar signs out, you tell the story of how you can affect and add value to all of those numbers in the story that you tell. Those who tell the stories rule society. Storytelling changes the biology in humans. So why aren't you using story to help your business grow? There are a couple of aspects that are really central to story. You have to capture their attention by giving them something that's either startling. Think of a movie, the movie that you love. If you like action movies, it's the opening scene is a car careening off the Golden Gate Bridge into the water. Captures your attention. Oftentimes, we only have nine seconds to capture the attention of the audience that we're trying to serve. Why? Because it's 2020 and there's so many things going on. We have a mobile device in our pocket, a tablet in our brief, and a laptop on a desk in front of us. Plenty of interruptions, plenty of multitasking going on. We've grown to have the attention span of a goldfish. A hundred years ago, when we were an ag agrarian society, we were growing stuff on a farm. When we'd stop after plowing the field, we'd lean on the fence and talk to our neighbor. We might talk for an hour. That's because the pace of life was different. Now, goldfish, nine seconds. In order to capture my attention, you have to provide an experience of some kind to get my attention. And that could be almost like, let's do a magic trick. Let me uh, pull a rabbit out of this hat. I wanna capture your attention in the virtual world. So I, when I have your attention, I can bring you value. The second thing is telling a story that transports you someplace else. I hope that when I told the story about that deal where the customer eventually asked me what they were buying from me, transported you to Vegas and to that conference room that was covered in whiteboards and you can almost see the imagery of the technology graphical representation of computers and networks and software things. Paint it with felt tip marker on the wall, growing with every visit that I made, every landing of an airplane from LAX to McLaren and rental car drive to that tall building of this large healthcare company supporting tens of thousands of people that they wanted to do better and be more efficient. And I had the opportunity to help them accomplish that. First, capture and hold their attention. Second, make the story, transport them. Make the story, make them feel like one of the characters in your story. Storytelling is, when you do those two things, storytelling is memorable. Because it's memorable, it's repeatable. Because you made them feel like they could see themselves, relate to the characters in the story, almost see themselves in the story. It's highly relatable. That's when they lean in. Those are a couple of things that we really should always practice doing when we're thinking about storytelling. But Think of storytelling in four acts. Act one, do the work, the story, listen. Act two, story building. Story building means, sure, you can sit at your kitchen table or in your office or your den and conceive of how I take all this data and turn it into a story that's going to be compelling and thought-provoking for the people that I'm trying to reach. That building process shouldn't be done in a bubble because if you just build it in the bubble, you're only reaching the implied answer, the one that's implied by what you happen to know about those people you're trying to reach. If you take that story and you go and you call one on the phone or you meet one for coffee somewhere, maybe after COVID you meet them for coffee, 
and you say, look, I'm, you know, you're my ideal customer. We've been doing business together for quite a long time. I, you know, you're, you're kind of one of my insiders that I bring some of these questions to, and I've got another one, new products coming out. And here's the way I want to present it to the world of my ideal customers who are just like you. So here's what it says. Here's the messaging. Tell me what you think. You're getting feedback in the building process to assure that the words and the cadence and the, the story that you're relating makes them feel like they're part of that story. And if you're talking to one of your customers that already has gone through this exercise with you in past product launches, do it again and do it often. Make the building process assure that you get explicit information that the story that you've crafted or built is going to resonate with your ideal customers because you talk to one or two or a dozen. Story listening, then story building. Then comes the storytelling. Now that you've listened and you've built a compelling and thoughtful and insightful story, you can tell it and share it. This is where marketing comes in. If you know where your customers are in the fabric of the World Wide Web, you share it there. If they're on Instagram and not on TikTok, you go Instagram. If they're on TikTok and Twitter and Twitch and not Facebook and Instagram, you go there. Tell your story where your customer is. And if you've done the work to listen and build it well, it will resonate with them like it's music to their ears. And when they do get engaged, and they do text you, that was, I just asked somebody to text me that phone call. When they do get engaged and they do respond to the content that you've produced and the story that you've told, and voila, now it's time for story selling. Now you get to tell them the myriad of stories that you've crafted and built that you use in the appropriate situation. I like to think of it as I enjoy archery and always have from the time I was a child making my own bows and arrows to today. I've got these expensive rigs that I just shoot at targets. It's relaxing, the zen of archery. Well, the quiver is where the arrows rest, either on the ground or on my back, depending, or on my waist, depending on how I'm feeling and what kind of target I'm shooting at. I might have a dozen arrows in my quiver. And it's a metaphor, that quiver and those arrows, for your stories. Because you don't have just one story. You have an origin story, a founding story, a customer story, that's their story a product story of how the product solves the problem the customer has. And then the evolution story, the evolution of your product, the evolution of you, the founder in the business, the evolution of the customer who changes every time a pandemic hits, every time unemployment goes up or down, it affects your customer. They evolve. So there's a ton of stories out there that you have to listen for so you can build the stories that become the arrows in your quiver that you can tell. When the customer says, you know, it's really been a tough year. I, I know you've got a product launch coming out, um, but, you know, I, I'm still paying for the last product that I bought for you from you two years ago. How is this one going to help me um, differently than the one that I currently have? And you think about that question and you think about who's asking it and what you know about them and their particular business and you're reaching your quiver and you pull out that story that's tailor-made to answer that question for them. That's what story selling is. You can't do story selling without first listening, building, and telling. And that process is probably 70% listening because if you don't listen well, you can't build well. You'll build something that's gonna be like a house of cards. It's make, make you feel good. Your mom and your wife might like it, or your, 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 your son and your, your husband might like it, but your customers not so much. Why? Because you never engaged with them during the building of that story. So, Plato said it, those who tell the stories rule society. Science tells us today that a thoughtful, insightful, and compelling story, well told, can change the biology 
from the person that you're telling it to. So shouldn't you be using story in your business? I hope this 30 minutes or so has provided you with some ideas and some inspiration and some motivation to go and become a better story listener, story builder, storyteller, and story seller. There's more where this came from. Certainly we can drill down into the granularity of it all. Be a leader first and nurture your emotional intelligence. Know your own narrative so you know where your integrity and character spring from, whose shoulders you stand upon today to get here. And when you've done the work to listen well, be a good communicator. And that will help you succeed in life and in business. So once again, my name is Art Jones. I am the founder of The Art of Standing Out, where we use narrative storytelling to help you market better and sell more. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And good luck out there. <laughs>